Hi. All right, our next speaker here. Hello. Hi, Chad Hart. Hello. That's who we have on stage. He is an analyst and consultant at CWH Consulting. He has authored a report on applications of AI in real-time communications. He has launched a WebRTC startup. He's a frequent speaker and blogger at WebRTCHacks.com and Cogent.ai. Cog Cogent. Cogent. Co like cognitive Co intelligence. Yeah, yeah. There we I go. Know, it's, it should have been more original. Cogent.ai. And he's going to be giving us a walkthrough of technical approaches to implementing a voice bot, voice bot for IVR replacement. The title of his talk is Kill Your IVR with a Voice Bot. Tell us all about it, Chad. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't need to go through this because you just did that. Um, just uh, maybe I'll bring up two points. One, I care a lot about WebRTC and I care a lot about um, AI and RTC topics. And there's going to be a WebRTC round table at 4.15 today. Uh, so make sure you stick around for that. So this talk is really uh, at the core of it is about how I, I really hate IVRs. Um, I don't think I'm alone. I mean, is there anyone here actually like IVRs? Anyone get excited about IVRs? So I, I've, I've hated IVRs for a really long time. Um, and I've been really excited about voice bots. Um, so you know, voice bots, actually, Diego gave some introduction to that um, in a couple sessions ago uh, on that topic. So I, I see a lot of potential here. So this is essentially the core of the, uh, what I'll be talking about. Why do I hate IVRs so much? And, and the root of it is really this DTMF thing. And did you realize like DTMF, Bell originally, originally introduced this to the public in 1963, right? So we've been using DTMF for 56 years. Um, and I don't understand how come we haven't gotten past it, right? We're still like punching digits to, to navigate through um, and to talk to somebody online. It, it's, it's insane. And we should be able to do better. And one of the main challenges with that little, uh, with that keypad is that there's a, a limited number of keys, a limited number of things you can do, right? And because people can't remember 10 options in most cases, and because it takes a long time to read through 10 options when you're giving somebody a choice of a menu to go through, you have to limit that to like three or five. Um, and as a result, you end up with this really complicated hierarchy thing. Uh, and it gets, it gets really hard um, to try to fit all that in. And as a result, either you have a really complicated IVR with a lot of hierarchy that really pisses people off, or you have to have a really dumb IVR that, that, that's reasonable to navigate through but doesn't actually provide the user a whole lot of information. Uh, and the whole purpose of having the IVR in the first place was to help to you know, offload uh, and not have to have a person answer everything uh, every time. So uh, speech recognition, uh, you know, speech IVRs, actually they, they make the situation a lot better. I mean, this actually technology has been around uh, for, for quite some time. The challenge with a lot of this stuff still is that it's still largely based on, it's all based on XML, right? All like derived from VXML. So you end up like with this document that has a start and end, and it's by nature ends up having some kind of hierarchy, right? Um, and certainly there's tricks and things you can do to make this better. Um, it does give you more options, um, but it's still pretty limited um, in terms of how we actually talk to people. Um, the whole idea of having like an if then else type statement for everything um, one is difficult to program, but that's just not how people communicate. That's not how we talk, um, and it's really difficult to respond. What we really want um, is a really flat hierarchy, right? Where you don't have to go through that. So you know, imagine if you're calling a grocery store and you want to find out if they have soy milk, right? You want to just be able to call up and say, "Do you have soy milk?" You don't want to go through a menu and have to say, "All right, well, you know, give me your dairy category and give me your." You know, sub dairy item or you know non milk or non cow based dairy items, right? It's, it gets ridiculous when you start thinking about how would you put all that information in there. Um, and even going back to the speech IVR example, like you won't, you don't actually want to program every single item in there. I mean, you, I guess you could do that um, in a speech IVR, but it's very complicated, right? What you really want is like a, a flap system that can just understand what you're trying to say, look up the right information, and just give you a response. And this technology is here actually already. I mean, the, this, the voice bots are pretty pervasive already, right? Um, we have Siri, we have Alexa, uh, Cortana, um, Google Assistant, right? These are all here, and we've been using these quite a bit. But you know, these technologies have been largely consumer-based. But 
we see, you know, over the last couple of years, this is really starting to change a lot, right? And this voice, back te voice bot technology is increasingly being applied um, not only to consumer stuff, but into business type applications, right? So IBM Watson has actually been doing quite a, a bit in this area, um, you know, specifically around telephony. Uh, you can see, you know, Google even recently had their, you know, last year had their Google Contact Center AI initiative, and they're bringing on more and more big kind of, uh, you know, UCAS or, or contact center as a service type players getting involved in that. Uh, even actually more recently, you know, just looking at uh, Alexa, uh, Amazon just recently opened up a couple WebRTC based uh, real time communications APIs that work with Alexa to actually allow Alexa to make calls um, to other devices, right? So this is this technology is starting to come together um, and, and intersect. So uh, there's a, a lot of different voice bot technologies out there. Um, a couple considerations you, you do want. Well, one, you want to make sure that it has good voice recognition. There's no use in having a system that you can talk to if it can't understand uh, your, your users and the people calling in. You want to have realistic text-to-speech, right? Nobody enjoys listening to a robotic voice. That's not a great, great experience. Um, and ideally, it has actually many voices, um, so you can give it some customization. Um, you know, every business has their kind of unique brand and style, so you want to be able to, to modify that. Right? We're talking about plugging this into phone systems, you know, for, so it has. You know, ideally, it would have some kind of built-in telephony or telephony support uh, along with that. And I also think it's very important. Um, it has you know multi-platform support, right? Where it can, uh, it's easy to run in multiple locations. Um, it can interface with other third parties or APIs. It's not really necessarily dedicated to a single API or single ecosystem, right? And this can be challenged, especially the these solutions. Um, for example, you know, the, the it could be just tied to say, you know, the Google Home. I actually used, uh, you know, Dialogflow. Um, Dialogflow came out of a, you know, a company Google acquired, API.ai. Um, API.ai was actually very good at supporting um, not only dial, you know, Google um, or not only Dialog, uh, not only the Google Home, uh, Google Assistant ecosystem, but also Alexa and others, right? So um, it's a good platform. That way, if you don't actually like one ecosystem, it's not like you're throwing everything away. You can still use that same bot builder framework uh, on other applications. So uh, I'm not going to do a, kind of a dialogue flow tutorial. There's actually a, a bunch of good ones online. Um, it plenty, it's actually pretty easy to get started uh, with that, but um, there are, I guess, a, a couple terms and concepts, right, um, that you should be familiar with. And one, you know, when a user speaks a phrase, that's known, you know, termed as a an utterance, right? And the whole point of the natural language understanding system is to be able to convert that utterance, right, and, and take something you say uh, back into, you know, um, basically map that to an intent. Right, and intent is really just something as you, as a developer, uh, entity that you define. Right, so if you go back to the you know use case before, you can say you know I care about soy milk. You know maybe the um, intent is you know, tell me about this object. Right, so like it's a, a lookup type intent, um, and within that intent, you can have things known as entities. Right, which are basically I, you know programmable identifiers, things you can you can access. In this case, it could be you know it could be milk or it could be soy. Um, you have a, there's a lot of flexibility, I and mean, a lot of the nuances in building a voice bot is actually how you set things up uh, along those ways. I'm not going to get into all those details, uh, but again, a lot of that is there. There's really solved problems uh, already. You know, these voice bots are, are pretty. They're out there. They're um, pretty widely used, and there's a lot of resources uh, for to do that. All right. Another key topic is fulfillment. Right. So once you actually do map an intent to an utterance, right, you want to do something with that. So that's fulfillment. Uh, so dialogue flow and actually a lot of other systems, they'll allow you to return a static response um, or and or actually you can also go have it go call a webhook, right? Um, and you can have that webhook either return additional data or go run and do something else in the background. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we can do there. So um, you, you, you have to start, you have a basic bot, right? Um, the next step is, um, how do you gateway? How do you, how do you basically get telephone connectivity uh, into this thing? And Dialogflow, one of the maybe benefits and also challenges is that Dialogflow uses uh, gRPC, right? General Remote Procedure Calls, um, to do this. They have an API 
uh, to do this. I, I don't find it all that straightforward when you're used to dealing with things like WebSockets. Um, but you know, apparently, it's pretty performant. Um, some of the challenges are actually you have to you know, basically use this interface and user APIs to do that, to, to interact uh, with Dialogflow. Right? And we want the, the gateway to be able to basically take your telephony signaling commands um, and be able to convert those to the appropriate dialog flow APIs uh, and respond to events and translate back and forth. Right? Now, beyond that basic you know, gateway functionality with his, you know, mapping the audio into dialog flow and the basic signaling, there are a couple other nice features or, or key features you really should have. Right? So in most cases, in an IVR, it's really meant to just help map to you to somebody who's going to respond to you. Or in most cases, you know, there actually is an agent or person that you want to be able to transfer to at the end of the day, right? So the gateway should be able to actually help you do uh, a call transfer, right? In addition, you know, a lot of times, if you're rattling off a bunch of responses or information, it should be smart enough to, that you can interrupt it, right? Um, and a lot of this stuff sounds pretty trivial. It should work. But then when you think about how, how do you plug this in and make dialog flow, uh, interact that way. It's not necessarily so so trivial, right? Uh, same thing is true of like no activity detection, right? You don't want you know, if if the if you're sitting there, um, you don't want to keep the you know, connection to dialog flow open, you know, indefinitely uh, while you're paying for. It. If the users basically walked away, um, you want to be able to say you know you're still there. As much as I hate DTMF, it still does come in handy uh, in some cases. Um, sometimes maybe you want it as a backup. In other cases, like if you're asking somebody to enter in like a serial number, sometimes it's just easier to have them type it in, um, that sort of thing. So and, you know, having some ability to detect DTMF and report events in the dialog flow is nice. Uh, and the last one is SMS, and I'll, I'll talk about that one separately in a moment. So if you want to connect in the dialog flow, actually, there's a really, really easy way to do it. Uh, dialog flow itself has a, its own um, phone gateway that you can just use. It's built in. They give it away essentially for free. You can use it for free. Um, they don't give you an SLA on the free version, but if you want to pay, uh, it's something like five cents um, a minute for the connectivity. Uh, it only right now that's only U.S. only, um, but you can go and you pick a phone number, and this makes it really easy. So if you go build a bot or actually have an existing bot, um, you can just go you know, hook into this dialog flow phone connector uh, and call in, and you're you know then you're connected uh, on the phone there. Um, and Dialogflow has a bunch of nice user interface features that um, if you want to go in and define a call transfer function, they make some of those things uh, pretty easy uh, for you to do. All right. Beyond that, actually, there's not a whole lot you can do because it's you know, definitely a, a black box. Um, but it's quick and easy um, and simple. All right. Second method, a little more complicated, was you know, leveraging the first one is actually just to take your existing, you know, free switch or telephony platform, whatever it might be, and just forward calls into it. Right? Um, and this gives you a, a few more options. Um, you know, one, this makes it a lot easier to record you know, the interaction uh, for, for debugging and uh, diagnostic purposes. Um, it gives you a lot more control over call forwarding. Right? If you do this method, then you can also choose any number you want or international numbers, multiple numbers. Right? You get the full power of your platform, uh, and you just forward things on. The downsides of this is actually you know, there is no real interaction with dialog flow, right? It's really just you're just piping the media through and just doing basic, like when you call in, it initiates a kind of a welcome or, or um, it's called a you know welcome intent to, to have the bot start. But you're not doing anything else with the bot, so um, you can fall short on a lot of those other um, those other criteria. Really, the ideal uh, method is some sort of direct connectivity. Uh, between your gateway uh, device and dialog flow, right? And I, I showed here, I end up, I'll show the next slide, I ended up using a couple different C++ platforms to do this um, that had the gateway functionality built into it. Um, but th this is really the idea, right? But, th but this means that, that that gateway needs to support gRPC and it needs to have a little more sophisticated um, controls. So there's a, a, a few different methods for this option three. Um, here, you know, I, I talked about you know the phone gateway. Um, actually, early on when I was investigating this stuff, uh, some of you uh, know, uh, you know Dave Horton, um, who runs the uh, Dratio project. I actually, worked with him, and he built a, uh, a dialog flow connector for Dratio, which you know uses free switch for to help on the on the media side of things. There, All right? There's a couple commercial options, um, and then there's uh, 
only really two CPaaS platforms, right? Signal Wire and Boxing Plant. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. I'm not going to go through this list in in you know great detail, but at the end of the day, none of these solutions were perfect. Um, if you need something really basic and you don't, you just need like basic connectivity and the ability to transfer. The built-in phone gateway is great. Um, if you don't like the phone numbers or the basically the telephony interface, or you want to just leverage your existing telephony platform, um, the call forwarding option um, is pretty good. If you want to do something more sophisticated, like I was trying to do, um, it gets a little more complicated, um, and that's a lot of what I'm going to talk through the, you know, for the rest of this talk. So before I get into that, I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about SMS because um, I, I was surprised. This actually, you know, isn't isn't used a lot more. And, and why would you want to have SMS be involved with your IVR or have some kind of connectivity? And you can think in a lot of cases when you're talking to your IVR, you know, it, it's limited in the amount of time things can, it can say back to you because one, it is not totally sure. Maybe it's telling you something you don't want, and it's just you know speaking on and on. You know, the answer might be long. In some cases, it's easier just to send you know the user back a link, right? Like. Can I have directions? Um, like, sure, how about I just send you a link to a map, right? You can plug in your phone. Makes it a lot easier, right? The same thing is true with documents. Uh, in a lot of cases, when you're calling an IVR, um, maybe you're setting an appointment or you know, there, there's some kind of reminder involved. So um, having SMS as a reminder mechanism in that channel is really helpful. Um, in general, just having an asynchronous channel that you can maintain communication with the customer in is actually you know, really valuable, right? That it's, it's hard to establish that sort of thing. Um, so if you can do that, that's just another benefit, right? That's another easy way for your customer to, to, to speak to your business. So adding you know, the SMS channel, um, you know, ideally there'd just be this gateway thing and you could just handle SMS. Unfortunately, nobody makes that. Um, there are a couple different you know, options here where you want to actually do it as a separate channel. Um, and and you know, doing some investigation here. I mean, I, I, I use SignalWire, and you know, SignalWire has a ILFO connector, um, and just randomly playing around with it. Um, if you go, you know, taking a step back, if you go into Dialogflow, um, one of their integrations that they have available is this Twilio text connector, right? Which like basically lets you just go and put in your, you know, Twilio credentials, um, and it gives you basically a webhook URL. And if you send information there, then uh, Dialogflow will just return, you know, basically you'll send the text message to Dialogflow and it'll, re it'll return the response automatically. I just took this and the same information and plugged in the, um, the signal wire information and it worked. Um, now, I, this is not, I don't think, officially supported or they talk about, but since, you know, uh, it's pretty close, it works. Uh, so this ended up being a pretty good, pretty good hack. Um, so that got me uh, SMS support. And um, frozen here. So, and then uh, as I showed in a couple slides earlier, I, I actually ended up using Vox Implant um, for the voice part of things. Uh, you know, Vox Implant had a really good, um, as part of their real time execution engine, real time scripting engine. Um, they have basically wrappers around a lot of dialogue flow APIs, which gives you a whole lot of control um, and, and ability to do um, implement all you know a lot of the features I wanted to implement. But so this left me with a challenge where I actually had you know two different channels uh, going into dialogue flow um, and with two different platforms, I actually had two different phone numbers. Maybe in some cases you can get away with that sort of thing, but it's kind of weird if you call one phone number and you get a text you know message back from another one. Maybe you can get away with that. I really wanted to have a, si a single um, a single number, a single system. So I actually ended up using signal wire and just forwarding the calls to um, over SIP to Vox Implant and handling it that way. Um, it seemed to work. It's kind of complex for what I'm trying to, you know, um, as you see, kind of building on. It made it work, but it wasn't so simple. At least not all that straightforward. Then, um, but yeah, after I actually had all the telephony parts, you know, working, I had voice and, had, and SMS, and I had it set up in a way where you can, you know, say, you know, can I have directions? And if it detects that you're on a mobile phone, um, you know, you can ask, like, you know, would you like me to, you know, the bot would return, you know, respond over the phone. Would you like me to send, you know, that to you via text messages? Text messages say yes, and then um, it sends back the message, right? Um, programming the bot in here, you know, is it's not a, a trivial task. I mean, like I said, there's a, a whole nother topic uh, on its own. 
Um, there are a lot of challenge, you know, challenges here um, to doing this. One of the the big ones that we ran into in trying to do this um, is one: we, if you're building this for a large call center, right, and you just have one really big customer, you probably have a few people that's going to, you know, they'll spend a lot of time on the bot. Um, our target audience and what we were thinking here was actually not for, you know, a massive call center. It was actually, you know, can this be made available for smaller, you know, medium, small type businesses for a lot of the most annoying IVRs that you run into every day to replace those, right? And in those cases, most small business users certainly aren't going to go inside the dialogue flow and be able to use that, right? It's, it's definitely not at that point. Um, but I guess we hypothesized that if we set up the right system and had some sort of templating engine, right, uh, we can maybe make it easy for uh, someone who doesn't necessarily have any voice bot or any development skills at all to just fill in the information about their specific business, right? You have a kind of a structure that can they can you know choose through. And we ended up with this architecture uh, where we had a bunch of templates um, and basically assigned that to an individual dialogue flow um, agent, right? You know, agent's kind of an individual bot uh, inside. Now, one of the challenges with dialogue flow um, is the way it's set up is basically requires you to have a separate, you know, Google Cloud Platform GCP project for each agent. Um, and you had to go and get its own set of credentials, um, and there was no programmatic way of doing any of this stuff, right? Um, which, fine if you wanted to go and do it by hand for you know a handful or maybe a couple dozen, it works. Uh, but if you want to try to scale this up to make it more automated, it, um, it, it's pain in the butt. Fortunately, just in June, um, Google did just introduce a programmatic way of creating an agent, uh, so that goes away. But you see, there's you know, there's a lot of hurdles uh, along the way. So um, what do we what do we learn today? All right, what do we do with this? Um, it's kind of a, a long story. I did get it working um, you know, reasonably well at the end of the day, uh, but it certainly wasn't easy. Um, there's a lot of options for doing this. Um, they're definitely imperfect, uh, but they're they're workable um, in depending on your needs. If you just want to use, as I said, you know the Dialogflow phone gateway is pretty easy. Um, if you want just a simple way of connecting in um, and you don't need a lot of advanced functionality, um, you can just use the dialogue flow connectors for like signal wire or, or box implant, right? If you want to get more advanced, then you can get into more coding. If you want to get really more advanced, we can go and use some of the open source platforms I referenced and, and really tweak things um, and modify it. But this is all, it's all there. But, you know, again, not, not for the faint of heart um, in, in the most advanced situations. Two, I was surprised actually the I, you know the SMS part of the IVR was a lot simpler, very easy to do, and it's kind of a natural interface for the way bots work in the first place. Uh, I'm a little surprised that I don't see more IVRs doing things like that. Um, and really, the, you know, the third one, um, you know, I, I mentioned some assemblies required, right? They can, the, if you want to go beyond just kind of the surface level, uh, it can get pretty complicated. And certainly, this is not at the point where it's you know, ready for, for end users to do, right? Um, to really make this uh, available for a broader audience, uh, a, a lot more maturity is needed. And uh, you know, I do think we're kind of in the early phases of this, um, right? Where we're you know, the, in, in the transition of uh, you know, moving from DTMF to speech to having more of a voice bot based, based system, right? So ho hopefully, this stuff is not too far off, and uh, next year, we show a lot of progress. I've written all this up, um, actually, in a series of five blog posts um, over at my you know, blog at Cognit AI. AI. Um, I also want to thank uh, Emiliano Policcioni uh, over at WebRC Ventures. Um, he was interested in, in learning about dialogue flow and playing around. He actually helped me uh, set up a bunch of stuff. So um, he was a, a co-author on a lot of this. And uh, if you want to, you know, if you're in in the market for paying, uh, paying for research, maybe the, the signal wire crew, now that they uh, got some funding, can, can afford some research reports. I, I did do a, a deeper market research study um, along with Sai Levant Levy um, on AI and RTC, you know, looking at, among other things, voice spots. And uh, with that, maybe I'll take some uh, any questions. First, let's give him a big round of applause. Thanks for that great talk. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions for Chad? Right here in the front. 
it, it um, I found it does pretty well uh, in recognizing different aspects. And one of the, I mean, the other good things about Dialogflow, it actually has very good different language support. I mean, Google supports like 110 different languages and dialects. Um, not all those are available inside Dialogflow, but um, if you know beforehand, if you're in a certain country or whatever, it actually has very good support uh, for different locations. In general, the technology, because it's like so, it's all based on technology for like the Google Assistant, right? Um, so it's in billions of smartphones and you know tens of millions of Google Home devices. It, it does pretty well. I have not specifically tested it, um, so yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't expect it to be perfect in all locations. But I, same token. I mean, I'm from Boston. If you had somebody from a deep Louisiana accent for a native Bostonian speaker, they probably wouldn't understand them either. So um, I, I can't necessarily say the bot, you know, the, the system would be a lot much worse than a, than a human in some cases. Other questions? All right, right here. Uh, I didn't, uh, so like the, the, the Dratio system I refer to, so I didn't do that myself. Uh, Dave Horton did that. Um, he knows what he's doing. He's really good. Um, I don't. I, I, it didn't take him too long to figure out the gRPC interface. He had some experience doing it for the Google speech um, in the past, so it actually, I, I, I don't have the impression it was too hard for him um, to do. And it's, it's, it's all open source too, actually. If you um, just search for Drash, or if you go, I think it's drachio.org, um, or just yes, D-R-A-C-H-T-I-O, search for it, you'll, you'll find it on GitHub. And I actually, I think I linked to it in one of the articles too. Any other questions? Go in once. Uh, That is a meaty topic. Um, there's a, co a couple, of, yeah. Um, but one is like, well, is this the best way to communicate? When Google released Duplex, actually, they said 60% of businesses actually don't have an online booking system, right? Now, Google could have gone down the path of setting up a super easy to use online booking system for everybody to use. I mean, they certainly could have done that. Instead, they chose to use the phone um, and connect to businesses that way. Um, and I think the reason, it's good for people in this room, right? I mean, because we're, we're phone experts. Um, one reason though, it is, I mean, it's a comfortable technology for everyone. It is kind of a lowest common denominator. Like, you know, it's always gonna work, you know, it's always gonna work at the end of the day. Um, there's that. I guess the second aspect, if you were interested, there is another Google project that does, you know, Duplex is about making it easier for consumers to reach businesses who don't have a, like, on, you know, good online presence, right? Um, via the phone. There's another one to help small businesses. Uh, that's called CallJoy. Um, it's a kind of a Google Project 21, I think they call it, one of their kind of um, startup spin-outs um, in there. So there's a project to do that. The over, overall, the Google Duplex technology is actually based on all of the same sort of stuff. It's just things that they won't release to the public probably for another two or three years uh, in there. But I guess I would expect to see some of the things they're doing with Duplex. I mean, that, that will come to Dialogflow eventually. All right, any final questions? Going once, going twice. All right, big round of applause once again for Chad Hart.